This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio is brought to you by the IEEE Computer Society and by IEEE Software Magazine. Online at computer.org slash software. Developers, are you ready? It's time to upgrade your data platform to InterSystems Iris. Choose your language. Choose your tools. Choose your environment. Collaborate, build faster, and deploy more efficiently. When you can make faster decisions, there's no telling what you'll create. Ready, set, code. Start coding for free. Visit intersystems.com slash try to try Iris. Welcome to Software Engineering Radio. I'm your host, Akshay Manchale. My guest today is Ryan Singer, and we're going to talk about remote work. Ryan is the head of product strategy at Basecamp. He's the author of the book, Shape Up, Stop Running in Circles, and Ship Work That Matters, which explains Basecamp's software delivery process. He was previously on SE Radio to talk about just that back in 2019 on episode 389. Ryan, welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Ryan, given that a lot of people are working remotely and with your long experience in remote work, uh, what are the biggest transitions that one would go through to start working remote? It's an interesting question because for us, we we didn't have to make a transition. We've been remote for you know twenty years now, <laughs> and uh, so it's something that we're used to. You know, I think that the transition to make is actually it's interesting. The mistakes we make when we go remote are actually the same mistakes that we make when we work together into the office. When we're all in the office, we too easily get into a room and have a meeting when we need to solve something. And when we're remote, we too quickly reach for something like the video call or the Zoom to, to, to figure something out. And, and it's actually the same problems happening in both places, which is that we are not uh, using enough asynchronous communication and that we tend to just sort of get everybody together to talk instead of thinking through kind of what we're trying to do uh, on our own time in advance, you know? So that's, that's the big, I think that's the big most important shift to figure out actually, is how do we start to plate things up for each other so that people can think through things and respond to things in the little slices of time that they have in their day without having to line up everybody's day so that we're all talking at the exact same time. And that gives us the room that we need in the middle of our day to actually have those few hours where we can put our heads down and actually do the deep, difficult work that requires the concentration. And then when we naturally have those times in our day where we're not very concentrated or we are kind of bored or you know we're taking a break or whatever, that's the right moment to go check the messages and respond to things. And everybody's gonna have those moments at different times. So we want to figure out how do we change the way that we communicate so that everybody communicates when it's a good time for them without forcing everybody else to be on the same schedule. So communication really is a large part of our work culture. And, uh, you know, there's emails, there's meetings, there's there's in-person conversations, there are conversations that you have in passing. Uh, How do you classify these things and how do you actually go about thinking about what is an essential face-to-face meeting uh, and what is asynchronous and how do you think about that? That's a great question. The general approach we have is to start with asynchronous and then escalate to synchronous. So uh, we don't have any meetings that are kind of repeated or regular on the schedule. We only call a meeting when we have something that happened that now requires us to do some kind of problem solving together. And so that's a big part of it is we're asynchronous by default. But I, I I think an important thing to know when it comes to being asynchronous is that, you know, the only way that you can be asynchronous is if you know what you're what you have to do (laughs) if nobody knows what's going on and nobody knows what's happening and nobody knows what to do next then you have this like big cloud of confusion and the only way to get out of that is to get together and everybody updates each other and then says okay what are you doing what am i doing what's happening and then you become clear right we need to take some other steps so that everybody actually knows what's going on so that we know individually what it is that we should be working on and how we contribute and what we're waiting for from other people, you know? So a lot of that has to do with the fact that 
we are very deliberate about how we frame and shape the work that we're going to take on and who's doing what. We're very clear about who's doing what work. And that allows us to sort of separate from each other, you know? And and so I think it's really important to figure out how to be more deliberate about what we're doing instead of just kind of wandering and 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 sinking up again day after day. So in other words, there's a there's a larger ramp up time that might require face to face communication and synchronous communication. And from there on, you can take it asynchronously. Is that what you mean by trying to understand what everyone is up to? So I think it helps to get into the details of, of, of what your role is and what kind of work you do and what kind of communication you need. Because depending on your role, you're, gonna, you're going to need to coordinate with people in different ways. So for example, we follow the, the, the process that I outlined in the book Shape Up. And in that process, we've got teams who are working within the six-week cycle. So these are designers and developers and people doing QA. And then we've also got people on the leadership side who are figuring out what we should do next and, and shaping the work. And, um, and that's all kind of within the sort of product side of things. Of course, there's also ops and there's, and there's security infrastructure performance. There's other teams doing other things. When it comes to, for example, the betting table, where we choose what projects we're going to take on in the next cycle, we don't have very much uh, synchronous back and forth. There's a lot of uh, kind of individual preparation Jason is going to have ideas about what we should do next. David's going to have ideas. I'm going to have ideas. And we're each going to be working on those and preparing those as pitches. I might be far into a pitch and I might have a really crucial question about whether or not this is viable or whether I'm thinking about it in the right way. And then I might ask Jason to talk it over with me. So then we're going to have a one-on-one where we're going to talk that through right? But other than that, we're working very independently. But then when it comes time to actually make the decisions about what goes into the next cycle, that's going to be a call, right? So we have a a kind of a clear time. We're going to get in a call together and we're going to work that out. Then there's an announcement made to the teams and that announcement is written. So the teams can see all the work that's coming and they can see the shaping that was done as as write-ups. And Also, by the way, when we have that betting table conversation, there's pitches that are written that everybody reads beforehand. So it's not like you're going in blank and then you're seeing a bunch of presentations or something like that. There's a lot of written asynchronous communication that leads up as the preparation to that. But then when we, when we come to handing it off to the team, there's a write up that describes what's going on. And then the team gets a chance to absorb that. Then there's going to be a kickoff call which is an opportunity to ask questions and clarify things. And then from then on, for the whole cycle, the team is basically working asynchronously. And what we'll often see is a little bit of light coordination in the chat room at the beginning of the cycle, because there needs to be a little bit of, hey, I'm going to go explore the UI for this, and I'm going to go spike some backend for that, and then let's let's check in tomorrow and see where we're at, right? But that's happening. that's happening... You know, it's funny how chat is kind of synchronous, but it's sort of like loose, slightly asynchronous when you have a, when you have only like three people, you know, there can be a little bit of lag time between answering. So there's some nice flexibility there. And then what's going to happen is the teams are going to be very heads down and they're going to be posting things onto to-do messages in Basecamp, which have comment threads attached. And those enable actually uh, kind of slow asynchronous updates if there's questions or back and forth on a piece of work that can happen inside of the to-do. And then it might happen that after a week or two of work, some kind of a substantial question comes up, right? About are we pursuing this in the right way or there's a difficult trade-off that they didn't expect. And then they might reach out to somebody to, to say, hey, can we talk this through? And then you're having a meeting, but it's not really a meeting. It's more like you're working, you know, so I really like to distinguish the, the, the types of calls where you get a whole bunch of people together and then most people are sitting around and people are just kind of updating each other or trying to figure out what to do versus having a kind of work session, you know, where there's a defined problem and you bring a couple people who have the right expertise and then you work together to, to sort of solve it. So I would say actually the majority of the kind of quote unquote meetings that we have are more like where we're actually workshopping something, you know, you have just a, just a couple people who are the right people 
and they're applying their expertise to get unblocked on, on some kind of a problem or come to a conclusion about something. That's really interesting. You mentioned that initially you do a lot of upfront planning, and that makes sense if you're coming from a leadership position and uh, depending on your role, right? But uh, how do you, uh, junior engineers or people with uh, lower experience who are not in leadership roles, how do they effectively sort of go with planning or, or uh, get prepared towards you know not having these meetings to understand what they're going to work on or what they would like to work on, etc.? This is where the shaping is essential. If we are shaping the work before we give it to a team, then the team has these clear boundaries. They're like hard walls around the outside of the work that say this is these are the problems to solve, this is what's in and this is what's out, and this is what needs to get figured out over the course of the next six weeks. So it's the combination of having the shaping already done and having that clear deadline that actually this isn't just working two weeks at a time, two weeks at a time, two weeks at a time. There's back pressure coming from the end of that six weeks because we have this what we call the circuit breaker. If the project doesn't ship at the end of the six weeks, by default, it actually doesn't get an extension. So that means that the teams have to make trade-offs and say, how am I going to solve this problem, right? But they're not just wandering Oh, a, a, out in the wilderness without knowing where to go because they have the walls from the, sh from the work that was shaped. So that's really the big difference is when they have that clarity of what it is that they're supposed to be doing, then they can just focus all of their attention on how do I actually do that? And that's very enabling. Then they, you don't need to have a lot of meetings or planning or anything like that because the work is there and then you just dive in. Interesting. So on the theme of communication, there's a lot of large meetings that are top-down communication and large organizations, you know, like all hands and uh, leadership calls and things like that. How do you guys deal with those kinds of uh, communication? Is that also written? Yes, that's written. You know, uh, m anything especially that is that has the character of an announcement is better written because then you can, you can very carefully prepare it. You can describe everything that needs to be there. And then people can read it on their own time when they have the chance to do that. And then if, if because of the nature of the thing, you need to have some kind of opportunity for questions or for clarification, first of all, that could happen asynchronously as a, as a discussion thread. But um, sometimes that might not be appropriate, especially if, if there's an aspect which is more emotional or, or socially sensitive to the subject, you know, then you may want to, to be able to, to, to hear each other's voices and show body language as you, as you, as you talk through it. But still, in, in, in that situation, I think it would be better to start off asynchronous with the clear write-up and then schedule a Q&A, you know, as uh, if anybody has questions and wants to discuss this, here's an opportunity to, to do that as a separate thing. Mm -hmm. What about uh, just general small talk between uh, coworkers? You know, if I'm, I, I usually work out of the office, and I enjoy my conversations with some of my coworkers who sit nearby. You know, just finding out what they're up to. Uh, it's not necessarily um, communication that gets work done, but it's kind of like communication to get to know the person and what they're up to, and associating yourself with the broader organization. Uh, so, how does Basecamp go about some of those uh, aspects? That's the most difficult part of being remote. You know, you, you can't have everything for free. You know, you have to make some trade-offs. And unfortunately, I think the serendipity, the unexpected conversations, you know, those, those are the things that are the hardest. You can't really replace them, I, I don't think. And so, you know, we do our best. We have a couple mechanisms. The, the, basically three things help with that. And none of them are a replacement for the serendipity you get in an office. But like I said, you have to make a trade-off. The first thing is we do have the chat rooms in Basecamp. They're called campfires and every project or team has them. And we're very clear about something. So anything that has to do with decision making, anything that has to do with, with the work, unless you're in a really small team of two or three people, you know, that doesn't happen in chat because chat is something that just scrolls away and nobody should be expected to be monitoring the chat all day to catch everything that happens there, you know? Nobody will be able to get anything done if they have to watch the chat room all day. So, but if you have an understanding that the chat room is a place to just 
talk and goof around and share things with each other and you don't need to follow it, right? But if you want to just chit chat with people, that is actually a really good place. It's actually much better for socializing than it is for working, you know, and, and I think that's a very good distinction to have that it's everything in chat is optional. It's a good place to socialize. The other thing is we have a a feature in Basecamp called automatic check-ins and the automatic check-in basically notifies everybody at the end of the day that says, Hey, what have you done recently? And then we have a kind of convention for how we answer that. People just write a few bullet points that describe some things that they've done recently. And this is a nice way for everyone to have an ambient knowledge of who's doing what without having stand-up meetings. So I have a, a rough sense of what basically everybody in the company who's writing these updates is kind of working on, what problems they're in or what, you know, what projects they're doing. And that's, that's all happening asynchronously. And people just answer that when they have time, either every day or every two days, they'll answer. And that just kind of bubbles up to everybody. So that creates a kind of ambient awareness. We actually have the same type of automatic check-in for a few social things, which is also helps a little bit. Like, so we have one called, what did you, what did you do this weekend? And it comes up on Monday morning and then people share photos of, you know, what they did with the garden or where they went with the family or some, some, something that they cooked or whatever, you know, and it's, it's a nice way to just sort of uh, share some things like that with each other. So we have a lot of things like that. Um, So the automatic check-ins are good for that. And then the third thing is I actually think that the sort of regularly scheduled, how do I say this kind of infrequent, slightly random one-on-ones over video are really useful. So they don't quite capture the serendipity of, of passing by each other in the office, but uh, it's it's a nice way to sort of randomly sample the network. Mm-hmm. You know, you have like 50 people in the company and everybody's connected in different ways and, and, and everybody sort of naturally talks to certain people in their neighborhood around them. But if you can kind of randomly schedule, have a one-on-one with somebody that you don't talk to so often and there's no agenda, right? It can be very surprising the things that come up out of that, right? And it can turn out, you know, I just heard this interesting thing from the customer. Oh, we were just working on this thing a couple of weeks ago. Oh, I hadn't even thought about that. That's a really interesting idea, you know, and then things can kind of click like that. So those three, I think using the, using the chat, not for real work, but for socializing, having the automatic check-ins to have a sort of ambient understanding of what's going on with other people, and then kind of you know, once a month, a one-on-one with somebody from a different department and then kind of shaking that up with who you talk to is a nice way to sort of have some of that that sort of random, deeper interaction. Yeah, the, the transparency about what you're working on is, is really interesting that you guys do that. So I want to move on to uh, talking about, say, collaboration, right? So there is certainly, now you know what your plan is, you have to execute this and you want to collaborate with your teammates. Um, It could be whiteboarding, brainstorming sessions. Uh, How do you go about some of those uh, processes? Yeah, so inside the cycle, the the way that everybody makes progress is is by building. So we're, we're doing the shaping before the cycle starts so that the teams don't have to do kind of brainstorming and discovery, but that there's 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 enough clarity from the walls that are up that they can just kind of get in there and start to make stuff and start to spike. So a lot of the collaboration that happens within the designers and the developers is actually sharing code or sharing a screen that's in progress or looking at something. It's all real stuff, you know? So there's not, it's not a lot of whiteboarding. It's more here's my first take at that model. Let's look at the code or here's the pull request or that kind of a thing, you know? Mm -hmm. And then um, for the, for the shaping side of things, then there's, there's a, there's a certain amount of deep work that goes into trying to understand the problem, trying to frame, maybe we have three different approaches to something that we think we want to do and how do we figure out which one is better and which one is worse, you know? So there's some kind of a kind of deep work that needs to happen. And then out of that, some decision making or some 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 sort of workshopping together. So sometimes I'll dig into a problem and I'll do some customer interviews and I'll review some research that I've done and 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 whatever I can draw from. And then I'll come to a point where I think I have a solution that is a, a potential pitch for what we might build in a future cycle. And I'll work on that on my own. 
And then I might need some kind of technical feedback from David or, or Jeff, who's a very, very senior programmer here, because there's something that I don't understand about how this system works and what, what the implications are for the back end of this idea that I'm working on. So then we'll do a video chat and I will kind of walk them through, this is what I'm thinking, this is the motivation, and then here's what I think the solution is and what's your take on that, right? And that could be actually uh, kind of sketching on an iPad and the iPad is screen shared in. Um, so it's almost like a virtual whiteboard experience. It could be just talking it through. And then sometimes we'll get clarity just from that conversation. Or sometimes, um, like recently, I, I, I pitched a, a, a kind of a very unusual new feature idea for Basecamp 4. And I shared it with Jeff. And then Jeff went and he actually dedicated about three or four hours to spiking this Mm -hmm. to see if it was viable on the in the model the way that he thought it would like is the is does the modeling we have is the modeling we have going to do what we think it's going to do or not so he did a short three or four hour spike and then he wrote up his conclusions asynchronously back and then it was like okay cool like now i i can go forward with this right or there's other times where i'll dig in and i'll do the research and i'll think that i kind of have a direction but i'm not sure and then Jason might be curious based on my check-ins. Maybe he heard, hey, I heard you were working on this interesting new idea about email notifications. I want to hear mm -hmm. what you're thinking. So then we'll have a call. And there we're kind of earlier in the process. I don't have work product to show him yet. I don't have a solution to show him yet. But I can say, you know, I think I'm understanding the problem like this. And I think we have a potential to maybe explore this direction. And then we'll bounce ideas off of each other like that. So it's very, it's very ad hoc. But I think it's also very intentional. Mm -hmm. It's we know what we're trying to get out of the call. Either I'm trying to get feedback on a specific idea from someone who has domain knowledge that I don't have, or I've I've got an idea about how to frame the problem, but I don't. I'm not close enough to have a solution. So then we're bouncing ideas like that, you know. So it's it it very much depends on the circumstance. But the key point is that it's very intentional and it's very small. We're not bringing eight, ten people together on a call, you know. Okay. I, I can see how uh, being deliberate and intentional uh, works for, say, system design, data modeling, and some of those aspects. But what about uh, visual design? You know, how do you collaborate on, say, uh, wireframes and mockups? It may not be eight people on a call, but it might be two people iterating on, say, what the UI might look like. Uh, so how do you guys uh, do some of those kinds of collaborations? Yeah, that's interesting. So that, that happens, that's within the team, within the cycle, that type of, that level of work. And uh, we actually don't do any wireframing at Basecamp. We think it's the wrong level of fidelity to work at. So the designers will stub something. So let's say um, we're looking at the, what the web team is doing. The designer um, working on a web feature is actually going to put a view together with some of the basic elements wired into it. And then... They might drop a screenshot into the chat or they might make a commit and then say, hey, t t reload that screen. Check it out. I put the uh, I wired the button in there. Let's see how it looks. Right. Or I've got a rough version of the form in place. Let's see how that is. And then the programmers working with them might have some feedback that might happen sort of just back and forth in the chat. Or it could happen that there's a to-do. So the teams together, what happens is the, the designers and the programmers, nobody creates tasks for them, right? We, we, have, we have no kind of taskmaster type of a role. The work is shaped, the team takes on that work, and then they actually capture the tasks that they discover for themselves in the project. So the designer might have a task that says something like, you know, design the form, right? And then uh, when they make some progress on that, they could just attach a screenshot to a comment on that task and then if they have some question about it, they could mention somebody and then loop that in, right? So very often, actually, uh, there isn't a lot of back and forth. It's more about building and like, hey, I've got that in, right? And it's we, we really prioritize getting the elements into the code over having the right design. Because the thing is, if your code is clean and your designers are actually working directly in the stack themselves, they're not handing over a, a high fidelity mockup for somebody else to implement. You don't have to get the design right in the first shot. You can put the form fields in, you can put the buttons onto the screen. And then if you don't like how it is, you can just move them later. You know what I mean? You right. can, you can continually adjust like that. So we're much more focused on actually 
building real stuff and making commits uh, than we are sort of discussing the design, right? And then there's going to come a point from time to time where there's a hard choice to be made or the designer might feel like, ah, this just isn't working or maybe this isn't right. And maybe the designer has a review with Jason and they look at how it's coming and then they come up with a new idea for, for how to do it differently, right? So there can be kind of review calls like that that happen from time to time. But again, they're very intentional and they're very deliberate based on a question that came up. Calling all developers. There's no telling what you can create when you upgrade your data platform to Inner Systems Iris. Are you ready to build the applications you want, however you want them? Are you ready to develop applications faster than ever? Collaborate, build faster, and deploy more efficiently. Tomorrow's next breakthroughs are waiting for you today. Inner Systems Iris Data Platform. Ready, set, code. Start coding for free. Visit innersystems.com slash try to try Iris. On that theme about uh, checking in, code reviews are one aspect. Is there something differently that you do with code reviews or is that tradition? It is traditionally asynchronous. So, you know, does that continue or is there something different that you guys do? Yeah, so we have a a, a different attitude toward, toward co- code reviews and also toward anything basically quality related. Our general viewpoint is that review should not be a gate or a checkpoint. So we don't want to be queuing up work that needs a review in order to move forward. Instead, by default, we trust the teams to make good decisions and the teams have the authority and the autonomy to make the decisions that they want to make. And then that's what's going to get shipped at the end of the six weeks. So by default, there's actually no review. Mm -hmm. Then based on the opportunities that appear or the questions that come up, you know, let's say David knows that the team is, is, is working on something that's, that's, un, that's unusual when it comes to the modeling, right? It's something we've never done before, or it's something that touches a system that is, is a bit complicated. He might be interested in, in, in their solution. And uh, so he might be kind of watching the, the, the pull request. Mm-hmm. you know, or watching the new commits come in out of his own interest. And then if he sees something that uh, he has an idea about or he has some sort of input, then he might share that, right? Or if somebody who is a little bit more junior is taking on something that is kind of a outside of their comfort zone or kind of a growth opportunity for them, then uh, somebody who's more senior, who knows that this that that this is an uh, this is a, sort of an opportunity where they're being challenged, is maybe going to take an interest in how that's going. But they're not necessarily going to say, "Now is your review," or "Let's let's do a code review." They might just be paying attention, you know. But it could also happen that David is just busy doing other things. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then he doesn't pay any attention at all, and whatever ships is whatever ships, and it's totally fine, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, and it can also go the other way where rather than someone senior kind of taking an interest and looking at it, uh, the person who's doing the work might raise a, raise a hand and say, hey, what do you think about this? Or, you know, can I get some input on this? But it's, it's all about sort of, we're just trying to be convex to the situation. We want to have the opportunity, if it's helpful, to create a moment where there's some training or there's some learning or, or there's an improvement of what's there. But we just capture those opportunities when they appear and when they seem like a meaningful use of time there there's not a a, a formal process there where those things have to happen mm-hmm. related to uh how you uh, talk to say junior engineers how do you mentor uh, your junior engineers uh, continuously through this um, software development process or through their career we have a, a, a beautifully i think old-fashioned solution to that which is you just work together I learned so much at every stage of my career just by working next to people who were better than me. When I first started 17 years ago, when I started to work with Jason at at Basecamp, we were doing client projects and he would kind of assign me some design work to do. And then when we would talk it over, I would start to learn how he thinks just by the things that he would point out and the things that he would say to me and the patterns that I would notice, right? And then when I started to learn programming and I, and I saw how David, I was in David's code, you know, and I saw how David organized the code and it was just so educational to just be seeing the real work of other people. So 
just putting people together in teams is already a, a, a massive kind of learning situation, you know? So if you've got two programmers and a designer and one of the programmers is a bit more junior or more new to the company and, and then the other one is more experienced, then you immediately have a, all kinds of learning that's happening there. And so um, I think we see a, a, lot, of, a lot of maturity coming um, and a lot of, of growth coming just from sort of osmosis like that. So when you say working together, do you have more forms of synchronous communication where uh, maybe it's pair programming or maybe you work together on your written communication with the other teams? Do you actually do that together? The pattern here is that everything is asynchronous by default and escalates up according to the needs of the moment, mm -hmm. right? And because we have so few meetings in general, we don't have all of these sort of regularly scheduled meetings with a whole bunch of people. It means that, and because we're asynchronous by default, it creates the space for these random little meetings to happen when they're actually useful. You know what I mean? Like yeah. if you have so many meetings all the time, then, then if you actually want to talk to somebody about a real problem that you have, like one-on-one -on -one or there's, then, then there's no time for that because you already had so many meetings and it's like, Hey, I'm trying to get some work done. And now you, on top of it, you want to have this call, right? Yeah. But if you, if your calendar is totally empty all the time and all you need to do is work and respond to messages on your own schedule. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you have a question about something you're doing you could just ping somebody and say, hey, can we look at this together? And then it's actually not difficult to take that time together. Do you know what I mean? So it's mm -hmm. it's really about flipping all of the defaults upside down. Mm -hmm. And then by, by, by creating this free time in everybody's schedule by being asynchronous, then all of these random sessions can happen just totally ad hoc, right? And then there's no, there's nothing bad about having a synchronous session or, or pairing, maybe even just pairing for the afternoon on something, but it's not a matter of policy. It's not a matter of like a periodic plan. It's, it's about convexity. It's about taking advantage of a moment that appears and then having the space and the chance to actually take advantage of that. That makes a lot of sense. I guess I was going to ask you, uh, how do you collaborate across time zones? But uh, the asynchronous nature kind of takes care exactly. of itself, right? Exactly. And the time zones actually help you mm -hmm. because they kind of force you to be more asynchronous. You know what I mean? And they give you that that chant, that time where it's not practical to overlap, right? And then you you will naturally kind of tend to do more of the overlapping type of communication when the time zones are overlapping, right? So yeah. that's, that's actually really nice. Yeah. Well, that, that actually sounds great, but uh, are there any things that don't work because of this uh, asynchronous nature and across time zones? It doesn't work if the time zones don't overlap at all. So you do need to have some overlap. We've learned that that's important. War I mean, working asynchronously requires, you have to bring some conditions together for this to work. You have to have the right tooling, which this sounds like an ad for Basecamp, but it's surprising actually how few of the tools out there support mm -hmm. long form asynchronous communication. You know, if you're using something like Slack and Trello, or then you're, you're in a situation where you have a lot of fast churn of messages on the conveyor belt, but you don't have any way to post something important that you're sure everybody will see. Right. Mm -hmm. And so there's kind of this weird gap in a lot of the tooling between either you have email on one side or you have this like chaos of fast messages on the other side mm -hmm. and there isn't this zone in the middle. So whether, I mean, you know, we, we built Basecamp um, around kind of this zone in the middle of a, a high signal, meaningful message where when you post it, you know that the people you notified are actually going to see it and find it and read it and respond to it. And it's not just going to get lost in the shuffle, you know? So if, if you don't use Basecamp, then, then, then f look for the, the means that you're going to rely on to post something that you know other people are going to see where there's a question that you need answered or an announcement that needs to be understood or something that's going to impact, you know, you, you need to have a, a, a way to post that, that you're sure people are going to see it.
Otherwise, if you if a lot of people try to use something like Slack for for this, and what you end up with is you're either in a Zoom call or you're on Slack, and it's just this it's 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 really hard to get traction with the asynchronous communication that way. You need to get you need uh, something that's paced at the right speed to get that traction. I guess one way to look at it would be to change our mental model with respect to how we look at different channels on Slack uh, because a lot of companies kind of use Slack or just email, right? So I guess uh, groups on email or channels on Slack can be more deliberate with respect to what their expectation is. They can be deliberate, but the problem is that if you're in a chat room, then the very nature of the medium is that you have these short little messages that are just flying by. Mm-hmm. And it's very difficult to to follow up on it. The thing is that what what you really need when you're doing work together is to have subjects that specific subjects to the problem that you're dealing with. So I'm working on this side project right now, and we have a a product that does some algorithmic clustering of of interview data. And it turned out that the cluster, we used the right clustering algorithm, but we forgot a certain, there was some, for some reason, the clusters coming out didn't match the tooling we were using before. And we're like, are we using the wrong algorithm? Do we have a wrong setting? This is like the, this is the kind of thing that comes up, you know, <laughs> the, the, the algorithm isn't doing what it's doing, what it should be doing. And we have to solve this. And this isn't just some chit chatty stuff. This is like the work, right? <laughs> and so what I did is I posted in Basecamp a message and the subject of the message is blah, 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 clustering algorithm. There's no pre-made channel to discuss this problem. You know what I mean? It needs its own place with its own name so that when it pops up, people know what this conversation is about. And it's only about that one thing. And that's how you get the really high signal and the low noise in the conversation is because this conversation is only about this issue. And because you have a dedicated thread just to that one issue, now the back and forth is very focused and you reach a point where you have the solution and then the thread is over and now you're discussing somewhere else. So that's, that's where a chat tool is never going to do it for you. And you need, you need something that actually has a, a, a deliberate topic for what you're talking about in order to, because think about it, you need to manage 10 or 20 of those in parallel yeah. if you're involved in a lot of work. And there's just no way to know what people are talking about unless it has a, there's a reason emails have subjects, you know what I mean? So it's, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, what about things like learning and development, like, uh, you know, tech talks, maybe you've come across an interesting product that you want to talk to your team, or you've come across an interesting technical paper you want to discuss with your team. Uh, how do you guys do that? Yeah. Chat is really good for that kind of a thing because it comes back into this, this yes or no question. Is this, a, is this a need need to know for us to do the work? Or is this a nice to know because I want to chat with people? If it's, if it's nice to know, no problem. Just put it in the chat and then people either check the chat or they don't. And if they miss it, then there's no bad consequences for the work. If it's a need to know, then it has to go in a place that has higher traction than chat, right? So we see a lot of really good, you know, sharing of links and then check out this YouTube video and here's this cool talk that I saw. And there's a lot of that happening in chat all the time. And that's great. Chat is awesome for exactly that kind of a thing. So when it comes to like, say, uh, development of your own personal career, right? So you want a holistic development that involves, say, presentations, uh, being able to actually speak. Uh, So how does Basecamp go about some of those, um, you know, building some of those skills in your engineers in, in a completely remote environment? How do they build the skills to to go out and give talks or or to yeah, learn it, new skills or kind of like a little bit of both really? So in terms of just career progression and career development uh, in in a fully remote environment, uh, you know, what do you guys actually do there? Mm. So two things. First of all, I think I think we all too easily underrate how much we learn by working together with people who are more experienced. Mm-hmm. So again. Working side by side, or just the combination of, uh, let's say, so we, so for example, we have a team here called Research and Fidelity R and F, and Sam and Javon are uh, are the the two people on that team, and they are amazingly expert in JavaScript. Not only how to do things, but also the level of taste that they bring, the judgment that they bring, and the maturity that they have in their decision making is unbelievable. And what'll happen is anybody who is working on some JavaScript 
and they feel a little bit unsure about their approach or they would like some review, they will go to Sam and Javon and ask them for a review and and they'll get feedback. And the, the amount that you learn from a session like that is amazing. It's totally amazing. It's the same thing if I go to Jason to get some feedback on a design concept, he's gonna have some perspective that is gonna be not only useful to the problem, but I'm going to be paying attention to like, how was he thinking? Where was he coming from when he gave me that advice, right? And mm-hmm. by doing that repeatedly over time, you have a relationship that's basically like mentoring, you know? Mm-hmm. And um, I think that is where the real learning happens is through the human exchange it, over real work. When you're in the context of a real problem and you go and you say, hey, how would you do this? Or what do you think about the solution that I'm pursuing? That's That's the real thing then that's got to be 80% of where real learning happens. There is a 20% that I think is valuable as well, where, for example, I will post status updates about what I've been doing, but I try to, to go a little bit further than that. And I write almost like blog posts internally that describe the thought process that I went through or the, the strategy that I used to come to a conclusion on something. So um, when I do an interview project with a bunch of customers, I won't just say, here's what I heard from the customers. I'll say like, here's why we did this project at this time. Here's how I set up the interviews. Here's, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Here's like, here are the interesting questions that motivated the project. And then here's what we did with this, you know. So it's giving people a lot of context. and, And then I think it's giving people a chance to kind of learn what product strategy is as, as we're practicing it so far and, and what it actually means for me to do the kind of work that I'm doing. And then it hopefully invites people in so that if they're interested in doing a similar kind of work, they're starting to get some, some footholds and some handholds into, aha, okay, these are the steps involved and this is the kind of thinking involved. And, and then it gives them a chance to, to come closer. In other words, like as a uh, senior developer or a senior person with experience, being deliberate about the how and why you've come across, uh, come to a decision, uh, kind of surfaces that knowledge for someone who really wants to understand the nuances without actually creating a meeting to kind of like do that. Is, is that a fair way to put it? Yeah, you said that in better words. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. It's like uh, if there's a big decision to be made, then that's a really great opportunity to write it up in a way that tells the story of the decision and, and inc- including the, the things that were confusing about the decision or the things that where you, you struggled along the way, right? And then th- what methods did you use or which patterns did you reach for or what experience did you draw on and, and how did you come to a conclusion? And then there's also little things, you know, like we have a, we have a, a designer named Adam who does all of our marketing design and he's not only a visual designer, but he is very much on the cutting edge of like kind of what the right technology is to, to implement the, the designs. And he's really good about, he'll share in his, in his updates, hey, I tried this new platform before we were using Jekyll and now I'm using this thing called whatever, 11D or whatever it is, you know. And then there's some awareness of kind of what the new tooling is just from reading his updates. Like I feel a little bit more up to speed on, on what the cutting edge is. So there's a lot of knowledge transfer happening, even just asynchronously like that. That's interesting. Uh, earlier on, you mentioned about having these random one-on-ones with uh, people in the company. Uh, but how do you go about doing one-on-ones with, say, your direct reports? Uh, if you're a manager or if you're an engineer, you want to have a one-on-one with your manager. Uh, how do you guys structure some of those uh, regular things that happen in large companies? Yeah, I, um, I'm aware of the fact that that is happening. But I happen to sit in a weird corner of the company where... I, I don't have direct reports and I'm collaborating kind of horizontally with Jason and David on things. And then Jason and David have the final call on the work that I do strategy wise, what, which, what pieces of that work actually become bets that the teams go and build. So I, I have a lot of kind of horizontal collaboration, but I don't have people that I'm, that are reporting to me. So, well, we have other folks who are, who are doing that, but I'm sorry, you'd have to, you'd have to talk to them to get the answer on how they manage that, but they seem to be managing, but I don't know the mechanics of how they schedule that. Okay. That could be asynchronous too. And do you, do you know, or? as far as I understand, there's a, they're doing one-on-ones from time to time. We have a, we have a, across the whole company, semi-annual performance reviews. 
and those those of course take the form of a one-on-one call but i don't know i don't know the the regularity of those one-on-ones within those teams and and the thing is that our teams are fairly small so for example we have jonas who who is who's managing the designers we have jeff who's managing the programmers troy is managing the folks in ops each of them have people under them but who they interact with very frequently so it's not like there's someone that you never talk to and never see and then and then you have to sort of create this artificial time to interact there's a lot of interaction happening all the time you know so uh, but we'd have you'd have to talk to them to get the details okay i'll link to any resources that i might find on basecamp's website sure in the episode i know that jason and david did a really extensive q and a on remote working okay um, uh, maybe a month ago, and I'm sure they addressed that at some point in in that like maybe two hour uh, Q and A session that was recorded. I could imagine that they have some answers there. I'll I'll add a link to that. So, how do you guys uh, accommodate stressors outside of work among your coworkers? Um, you know, people might be going through a difficult time. People might have um, you know children and pets at home, especially right now with the ongoing pandemic. There are a lot of people oh, yeah. who are working from home who are not used to working from home, but they're working the same hours, right? So, how do you guys uh, look at some of those uh, stressors, and how do you deal with that? What I see Jason and David doing is they are very good at communicating their expectations and adjusting their expectations. The way that I see that they've responded to this change in circumstance, you know, before we, we've, we, like I said, we've been remote for years, but in the, in in the present circumstances, people are all kind of um, locked, locked down in the home with the whole family, which means that remote today isn't the same as remote, you know, a few months ago. And, and the thing that they did was they said, look, we know that you are going to be more distracted and that you have more things that you have to handle with having the kids at home and, and sharing the space with the whole family all the time throughout the day. And it's not going to be possible to deliver the same level of productivity and focus that you used to. And I think that that was huge coming from the leadership to say, we don't expect you to, to, to deliver the same mm-hmm. way you did before. Right. And, and that takes a lot of pressure off, you know, versus saying, you know, do everything you can. And, 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 you know, it's, it created that space. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we all felt a kind of life hasn't gone completely back to normal because we're still, uh, there's still, especially for the folks who have kids, they're still dealing with that. However, because over a month, I don't know how long it's been, but at least a month has gone by and, um, People have found their 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 new routines and their their mechanisms for how to work around things. You know, it's like you figure mm-hmm. out how to how to take the phone call on the balcony instead of you know, like yeah. you have to figure out where to go to have that privacy or or whatever. You know, people have been figuring that out, and then you start to see okay, it it, it seems like I uh, you know we still need to make an allowance for the change in circumstance, but it's not quite as extreme as before and we can adjust the expectations up again. And I remember seeing a post from Jason and David more recently that said, hey, uh, it looks like people are kind of figuring it out a little bit more. Things start to feel a little bit more normal. So, you know, we're going to bring this and that back into the picture again. And so they've been really good at, 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 at just taking responsibility for that, for, for, for setting the expectations. It's so typically, you know, outside of the pandemic, how do you take care of your well-being? Uh, what do you do to stay active, healthy? Uh, how do uh, other people in the company look at that? Uh, what are your thoughts around, you know, remote work and just well-being? Yeah. So the first thing, um, I think everybody has different struggles when it comes to this. For me, I found it really helpful to, first of all, identify that. So for the type of work that I'm doing, I, I'm not answering tickets all day. If you know, it's 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 different if you if you're doing creative work, if you're doing problem solving work, versus if you're doing something like support, where you you have to be res- responsive to a queue. Mm-hmm. In my case, and I think for a lot of people who are doing development and design, there's a certain f- sense that every day you should move the project forward, where you should have some new work that got f- completed. But at the same time, there isn't. There shouldn't be an expectation that, you know, for eight hours a day, all you're doing is coding, you know, because a mixture of your time goes toward um, catching up on the asynchronous communication. 
there's going to be a little bit of, I just feel distracted right now. So I'm going to like look at YouTube, you know, there's this a mixture of, 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 of moods and moments throughout the day. Mm -hmm. For me, I tr I try to make sure that every day I get into that place, that focused, concentrated place where, you know, three hours go by and I, and I, and I forgot about the world and, and I, and I really substantially moved forward on that thing that I'm working on today. You know, and if I get a three hour chunk of time like that every day, and then the rest of the day, I kind of catch up with people and nibble at different things. I feel pretty productive. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I think being honest about, about the, the different types of work that happen is, is helpful so that you don't beat yourself up because the whole day went by and, and you didn't get this or that done. Right. Yeah. And then um, for me, I find it helpful to kind of create different rituals that allow me to get into that zone. So different people have different times of day where they are more naturally in a flow. And for me, I, it's never worked well for me to get up and then first thing in the morning kind of go deep into the work. I, I like to sort of wander around and catch up on things in the morning and, and read this and read that and so on. And then for me, it's always been kind of after lunch is that moment where like now I will buckle down and I will solve that design problem that I promised myself I would solve today, or I will, you know, build that screen that I was going to build or whatever it was. And, um, I find it really helpful to kind of like change my location to, uh, in, in connection with that shift, you know? So I might be home at my desk in the morning and having video calls. I like to schedule all my video calls in that time of day when I know that I'm less productive. Mm -hmm. So I'll have a scattering of calls and catching up and then I'll have lunch or I'll leave, I'll leave the house and I'll go have lunch like at, at, the, at the coffee shop or something like that. And then I have this moment where like I'm in the new location and I get the coffee and then I open the laptop and this is like the ceremony of like, now I am starting new today, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and anytime I start to feel kind of stuck or useless or, you know what I mean? I, I, I like to do that kind of change in location or, or, or make the tea or make the coffee and sit down and, and then okay, now, now this, this three hour window or this four hour window kind of begins, you know, I, I find that really helpful. Yeah. I, I guess when, if there are leaders that are scaling back expectations and productivity levels, it creates that space to sort of figure that out as a remote worker. Cause a lot of people don't have that right now with say immediately with remote work uh, transitioning from being in the office. Yeah. The, the, a, a huge thing is just cutting down on the zoom meetings <laughs> really the more that you cut down on all these stupid meetings, the more you give people their you give people their time back, and then they can use that free time to play with their own schedule to figure out what works for them. And the thing is, once you figure out what works for you in terms of what time of day you take your calls and and when you answer your mail and when you do that focused work and 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 all those different things, and maybe when you take the walk or when you take the dog out or what these different rituals are, once you figure that out, then your productivity can go really, really high. You know, you just need the chance to, to, to rearrange the puzzle pieces until you, until they right. click into an arrangement that, that, that works for you. It's sort of like shifting away from what you're used to, uh, to figure out what works in this new environment is, is kind of like somehow seems really important from what you're saying. Exactly. It's a, it's a design problem. It's an innovation problem. It's a, how do I do this now that things are different? But then you so you need to do some experimentation and some trial and error. Uh, but then but then you figure it out. One more thing I wanted to ask is how do you guys have uh, company wide? Uh, you know, do you have team events or anything like that? Uh, how do you actually uh, socialize with your other coworkers, get to know them outside of the random one on ones? Is there anything else deliberate that you guys do? Yeah, we have twice a year. We have an all hands company meetup. So everybody goes to the headquarters in Chicago and then we're all together for a week. So that's one thing. And then individually, the different teams also organize so-called mini meetups. Mm -hmm. That's where um, everybody who's on ops or, you know, a bunch of designers or everybody who's working on the mobile apps will go somewhere for a week together. And those are amazing because, um, you know, if you have 50 people together, you can't actually interact with 50 people, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But if you have... 10 people together, you can really spend some time and get to know each other and have a lot of exchange, you know? So the, I think these mini meetups are really fantastic. Yeah. Okay, Ryan, so um, I want to wrap up. Is there any final thoughts that you have that you want to share with our listeners? 
You know, I think I think the main thing to do is to ask yourself before you reach out to other people, what am I trying what am I trying to do here? You know, what is the what is the result that I'm trying to get to? Am I trying to get feedback on something? Am I trying to get help on the solution? Am I trying to frame the question? Do I not know what to do? Do I not know what's happening? Like what am I trying to do? And then be more deliberate about the format. Think about if I reach out to somebody else right now and I ping them, I'm actually trying to interrupt them, right? Mm -hmm. So if I do ping them, then I can write them in a way that says, hey, when you have time, here's the thing that I would like a response from you about, or, you know, maybe we could schedule some time to talk. Err on the side of clarifying what you're trying to do more upfront instead of just saying, let's get on the phone and then we're going to talk it through, you know, and, and, and. Being more deliberate about both the content of the of the communication and the format of the communication has a massive multiplicative effect, right? Mm -hmm. If you have a bunch of people and they're all being more careful about how they line things up for each other and setting clear expectations about the communication, then this has a massive multiplying effect on the amount of free time that everybody has. Yeah. Well, uh, Ryan, it's been great having you on the show again. Thanks for coming and talking to us about remote work at Basecamp. Excellent. This is Akshay Machale for Software Engineering Radio. Thank you for listening. Developers, take your marks. It's time to upgrade your data platform to Inner Systems Iris. It's time to deliver complex mission critical applications in the fastest route possible. It's time to use any data from any source. It's time to embed analytics and create interactive user interfaces. So, what are you waiting for? Choose your language, choose your tools, choose your environment. Collaborate, build faster, and deploy more efficiently. Done and done. Tomorrow's next breakthroughs are waiting for you today. InterSystems Iris Data Platform, the fastest way to build applications. Ready, set, code. Start coding for free. Visit intersystems.com slash try to try Iris. Thanks for listening to SE Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. To provide feedback, you can comment on each episode on the website or reach us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or through our Slack channel at seradio.slack.com. You can also email us at team at se-radio.net. This and all other episodes of SE Radio is licensed under Creative Commons License 2.5. Thanks for listening.